when you think of speedy creatures, what usually comes to mind? Perhaps the lightning-fast cheetah or the gracefully swift ostrich? While both are excellent choices, have you ever stopped and considered a slug? Admittedly, the slow-moving nature of most slugs may not captivate your imagination. However, picture a unique breed, one meticulously crafted with a singular goal, to seize the title of the fastest in the world while rendering onlookers speechless as it surges across the finish line. This is the story of the Sunbeam 1000. Our story begins with a young man by the name of Henry O'Neill de Hain Segrave. From a young age, Segrave had an interest in cars and motorcycles. After his demobilization from the Royal Flying Corps, following his service in World War I, he promptly embarked on his career in motor racing. While residing at Six St Andrews Mansions in Marylebone, London, Segrave embarked on his initial racing venture in the spring of 1920 at the Brooklyn's Motor Racing Circuit in Surrey, a mere hour's distance from his flat. After winning several races there, he then became part of the Sunbeam Talbot Derrick team in 1921. Thus began a partnership that would change the course of history. Just two years later, he reached a noteworthy achievement by emerging victorious in the French Grand Prix at Tours. This outstanding accomplishment positioned him as the first Briton to win a major international motor race in 21 years. Expanding upon his achievements, Segrave secured a victory at the 1924 Spanish Grand Prix in San Sebastian. His triumphs in racing continued to grow, with a notable highlight in 1926 when Segrave achieved a groundbreaking moment by breaking the land speed record, reaching an impressive 152 miles per hour in his 4-litre sunbeam at Southport Sands, Lancashire. But regrettably, Seagrave's record endured for just a little over a month. For on April 27, 1926, racer Parry Thomas took Babs, his ex-Brooklyn's car that was sporting a 27-litre Liberty Aero engine, to Pendine, where he broke Seagrave's record at 169 miles per hour. The speed was further increased the next day, reaching 171 miles per hour. After seeing his record broken, Sigrave immediately asked Coatalan, the managing director of Sunbeam, if Sunbeam could retrieve the record, possibly with a car capable of reaching over 200 miles per hour. Coatalan knew that reaching this new feat could continue to bring valuable publicity to Sunbeam. However, he was aware that any forthcoming challenges would necessitate radical solutions. Upon recognizing the challenges ahead in the project, shareholders started harboring doubts, eventually leaving the team with limited funds. Kotalin had no choice but to construct the new car using components from the company's existing inventory. At the time, two 22.5-litre V12 Matabel Aero engines were stored at the Moorfield Works in Wolverhampton each capable of producing 435 brake horsepower at 2,000 revolutions per minute. These engines had been previously used in the successful powerboat Maple Leaf 4. Kotalin immediately sketched out a suitable car to use the engines. Following approval from the board, Sunbeam's chief engineer, Jack Irving, was assigned to create a detailed design. Due to the bulkiness of the engines, a side-by-side -side configuration became impractical. So Irving devised a different plan, to arrange the 12-cylinder engines in line, with one positioned at the front and the other at the rear of the car. Granting the car a balanced output of approximately 900 horsepower, despite not reaching the 1,000 advertised, still an impressive amount, as well as combined with a central gearbox using bevel gearing connected to a transverse shaft, ultimately driving the rear wheels through a final chain drive. It was a car with an equation for success. However, 
the Sunbeam team didn't stop there. Special wheels and tyres were designed by the Dunlop Rubber Company and several British manufacturers provided specialised components. Testing at Vickers Wind Tunnel at Brooklands allowed the team to craft the Sunbeam 1000 with maximum streamlined efficiency, resulting in its iconic slug shape. Even though the team at Sunbeam had such a limited budget, they were still able to create an engineering marvel. The only task remaining was to let the car prove itself. On February 21st, 1927, the car emerged from the workshop for a brief test run on the factory's roads before being presented to the press, garnering considerable attention for the Sunbeam 1000. Although it marked a joyful occasion to showcase the team's diligent efforts, Segrav was eager to surpass the newly set land speed record of 174 miles per hour by Malcolm Campbell in his new Bluebird. All that was left for Seagrave and the team to do was to find a suitable speed record site. However, this would be challenging. With Seagrave aiming at 200 miles per hour, it was felt that recent British locations for speed records lacked sufficient space, considering that running the car would need 4.5 miles to accelerate, a measured mile for the record, and a further 4.5 miles to stop the team looked elsewhere and found that the 20-mile beach at Daytona looked like an ideal location. However, the decision to run the car in the US had a discouraging effect on British sponsors, making them hesitant to support the record attempt. Consequently, Segrave had to assume a leadership role and take charge. Segrave had to negotiate agreements with the relevant American authorities and the American Automobile Association. Additionally, he assumed responsibility for all shipping costs and the wages of the team of support mechanics. To cover his expenses, he diligently sought sponsorship from numerous accessory companies whose parts were used in the car. After all preparations were complete, Segrave and the Sunbeam were set for their inaugural journey to the Americas. On March 2nd, Segrave departed from Southampton, sailing to New York aboard Cunard's flagship, Berengaria. Accompanying him were representatives from KLG and Dunlop, an eight-ton crate containing the car, an additional 18 crates of spares, three crates of tires, and eight mechanics. As well, Sunbeam sent a three-litre 1926 show car alongside the Sunbeam 1000 to enhance brand promotion. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. During the journey, Segrave was confronted with surprising information. Upon learning about Campbell's recent record, Harry Thomas, a competitor and friend, hastily made his way back to Pendeen with Babs. Despite not being in good health, Thomas persisted with the record endeavor. Unfortunately, the return run took a tragic turn as a chain snapped, causing the car to lose control and resulting in Thomas's immediate demise. Considering that the Sunbeam car also utilized a chain drive system, thorough inspections of the drive system became imperative before embarking on any record attempts. Even knowing that the Sunbeam car would be checked before the run, there was no uncertainty that the upcoming record attempt would become a perilous undertaking. Upon reaching New York, customs officials demanded a £16,000 import duty for the car and equipment. The car was then transported by rail to Daytona. At the same time, Sigrav and the support team embarked on a journey to Florida aboard the Clyde Line Mohawk. In Jacksonville, the group received a warm welcome from the town's mayor and was graciously invited to an official luncheon before commencing their road trip to Daytona, while at Daytona, Segrave opted for a three-run strategy. The initial run served as a familiarization session with driving the car, given his previous experience had been limited to slow maneuvers around the factory. The second run aimed at assessing the car's performance at a moderate speed, and the third run was slated for the actual record attempt. However, due to less than ideal conditions on the second run, a decision was made to postpone the record attempt 
by a week. During this period, several modifications were implemented to the car. On Tuesday, March 29th, the record attempt commenced. 9.30 that morning, Sagrave drove the car onto the sand, providing a visual spectacle for press photographers and news reporters. An approximate crowd of 15,000 people gathered to witness the event. Sagrave initiated the first run smoothly, starting from the beach's southern end and traveling northwards. After completing the initial run, the wheels were replaced despite the tires showing minimal wear, and the car was swiftly prepared for its return run. Unfortunately, during this run, the car overshot the nine-mile course, and the brakes appeared ineffective. With quick thinking, Sagrave deftly guided the car into the shallow waters of the beach, restoring control. He then made his way back to the timing box to await the results. Further examination showed that the aluminum brake shoes had experienced significant overheating and began to melt. Although Segrave managed to avert a potential tragedy, the experience fueled his determination to enhance his performance. Despite the setback, he could still sense that the record was within reach. With swift efficiency, the wheels and brakes were changed and the drive chains were meticulously inspected to finally send the sunbeam thundering back down the beach, well within the mandated one-hour time limit. With an 18 miles per hour tailwind, the run became even faster than the previous one. As Segrav completed his run and came to a stop, a crowd quickly gathered around him on the beach, eager about the news. Segrav, at the helm of the impressive Sunbeam 1000, achieved an extraordinary speed of 207 miles per hour. This resulted in a two-way average of 203 miles per hour through the mile. The 1,000 horsepower Sunbeam, assembled from spare parts at minimal cost, decisively shattered Campbell's existing record, increasing it by nearly 30 miles per hour. It marked a thrilling moment, firmly establishing Seagrave and the Sunbeam 1000 in history as the pioneers who first breached the 200 miles per hour barrier. Following the remarkable accomplishment, the team journeyed back to Southampton aboard the liner Berengaria. Their arrival on April 12th was met with a warm welcome from the mayor and mayoress who extended an invitation to a civic luncheon. This event marked the commencement of numerous celebrations that unfolded over the following fortnight and a promising and exciting future.